So hi everyone. Uh, for those who don't know me, uh, my name is Raul Cagaina and I am still a PhD student at Queen Mary University of London uh, and the demonstration shared this year. So this session is going to be split half in, uh, to show off the demonstrations for this year and half is going to be on the competitions. But starting with the demonstrations, what we're going to do is show a bunch of highlight videos for all the demos that we have selected. Um, I don't think we're going to have any time for questions and I'm not sure if any of the authors are actually in the audience to reply to any, but we do have a dedicated Discord channel for each of the demos. So please do check out all of those. Um, so I'm going to be sharing my screen now. Hopefully nothing goes wrong. All right, hopefully you can all see the presentation. You're fine, Raluca. So this year we had eight total submissions out of which we accepted six. And these are quite a varied selection from games used for research to games created from various research to tools facilitating games research. And in each of these slides, we're going to have in the top right corner the specific channel that we have in Discord set up for the demos. So you can go there and play around with the systems if they are already linked, find out more information and ask the author some questions. So first up, we have Hack VR, which is an object-oriented programming game in virtual reality. HackVR uses a VR programming language in which nodes represent functions and uh, node connections represent data flow. Players can then reprogram some VR objects such as elevators, robots, or switches. And to find the actual video, there we go. We have Sketch, which is a design tool for first-person shooter levels, which uses machine learning to provide the designer with gameplay predictions. The tool offers the designer feedback while creating levels, such as path information, predicted balance, or predicted heat map of player death locations. The system can further suggest design alternatives to improve on the predicted analysis for a more balanced game.
Okay. We do definitely have an author available for that one. So poke Antonius if you do have any questions there. Uh, next, we have Echo Hunt, which is a VR game used to study how interaction with game mechanics affects player experience in a virtual environment as opposed to a traditional screen-based 2D environment, and how this experience can be made even more immersive in VR. In Echo Hunt, the player enters a dark world and uses sound and limited visual information to guide themselves through the level. Next up, an open source collection of modules and plugins that can be used for synchronous data collection from multiplayer games through the lab streaming layer system. Lab streaming layer system. This tool can, um, can now record behaviors such as facial expression, posture, mouse and keyboard events, uh, psychological reactions such as heart rate or even uh, game state events. And the system currently supports the game Zonotic and Counter-Strike Global Offensive, but can easily expand it, be adapted to new games.
Uh, next up, we have Wrath of Osiris, a game combining physical exercise, challenging gameplay, and social cooperation to combat loneliness, boredom, and lack of exercise in times of social isolation. The game uses commonly available technology such as a webcam and networking to be accessible to a wide range of people. In Wrath of Osiris, players attempt to escape from a collapsing pyramid by positioning their bodies so as to fit through gaps in the walls. Long ago, a team of elite archaeologists were hunting for long forgotten treasure. Little did they know that it might just become their doom. The pyramid crumbles and the team has to run for their lives. It will be up to you to guide them outside. Take on the poses of the conveniently human-shaped holes in the walls. But beware, some are bound with ancient curses of Osiris and can only be passed with precise collaboration. Work together with your friends to get away unscathed. Will you safely escape Osiris' wrath? Or will the pyramid become your eternal tomb? And finally, we have Dismantle, which is another very relevant game for our current times. Dismantle promotes social engagement in times of isolation by gathering players together with the mission of defusing a bomb. Players use gestures captured by their webcam to solve several mini games, which are designed to encourage coordination, chaotic decision making, and skillful communication. All right, so that's it. Um, I saw the chat going a bit crazy on the last one. Hopefully all of that is interesting and I strongly encourage you to check out all of these very exciting projects more in detail on Discord and ask away any questions you might have. Some of the projects also have links to where you can actually download and play around with the systems. So if you're interested in that, check it out. I think Rafa is, should be around on Discord for those last two as well. If you do have any questions, find him. Um, and thank you very much for your attention. Rafa, do you have any comments? No, no, just to confirm. Thanks. Yeah, good. <laughs> uh, thank you. So that should be it for the demos. Please do find them on Discord for more details. And I'll pass on to Diego for the competitions part of this session. All right, thank you. Um, so now comes competitions. Uh, competition, actually. We have, uh, I think it's for the third time in FDG, uh, the Generative Design in Minecraft competition. So uh, that's going to be presented by Christoph Sol Salge. Um, I'm not going to talk too much because I know you are definitely looking forward to know what happened 
uh, in the competition. Uh, I'm just going to highlight the fact that we have a channel in this course for the GDMC competition, and it's called GDMC competition. Um, we have a few things there. We have a video of uh, Tommy experience while judging the competition. I think it's quite interesting to watch that. Um, it's quite fun. You can also find the different levels, download them, install them, and also play them. And there's also some other good stuff that is prepared for you, but I'm going to let Christoph to tell you all about it. So whenever you are ready, Christoph, take it away. Uh, thank you very much, Diego. Uh, can everybody hear me? Okay, so yes. first of all, uh, thanks for introducing us and I will point this out once now and once at the end. So on the Discord server, there's a bunch of information I've already uploaded. So you can already get all the maps I'm going to show you that were generated by algorithms. And we've got an exhibition server running uh, where we build a composite map with all these generators and you can log in and uh, play and experience this for yourself. And there's a bunch of other information you find there. And if you go to our website or our Discord, um, there's going to be a lot more stuff available after we announce the winners, like the code and a lot of things. But let's uh, first get started with the presentation, and I'll see if I can actually uh, get my screen to share the right thing here. So, hang on. Uh, okay. So, can everybody now see my presentation? Or do you see the the presenter view? It's presenter view. Oh, okay, hang on. My apologies for that. How about now? Great. Okay, excellent. So um, yeah, so thank you very much for having us. Uh, we are very proud of our, um, uh, you know, our long-standing um, tradition of being the longest-running um, competition at FDG. This is co-organized by me, Mike, Rodrigo, Christian, and Julian. And you might be wondering what actually is the Generative Design in Minecraft Settlement Generation Competition. And the basic idea is that we'll ask our participants to... Um, create an algorithm that can generate uh, a settlement for an unseen Minecraft map. On the left here, you should now see how this would look like if humans do it. So this is a, a time lapse of some humans building a settlement. And this looks quite amazing and magical. And there's a lot of cognitive stuff going on, a lot of intelligence being displayed. And the question is, can we actually build something like that? And on the right, you see our um, framework, or more specifically, MC Edit, which we're using for this. And all you have to do is basically write a Python filter. And you can start out with a few very simple lines of code. And we will then take that code and apply it to an existing map. And it reads in the map. And you will add your houses and, and stuff. So it's a wonderful thing to kind of throw at students. Uh, and several of our entries this year are actually made by students uh, at universities. And as I said, it's great to get started, but uh, you can do a lot of cool stuff with it, which we will see soon. So this is how it works. The participants submit their programs to us. We'll pick three unseen competition maps. We'll apply those filters to the maps, to three different maps every time in the same space. And then we'll send that out to a bunch of expert judges who are like PCG, people or game designers or YouTubers or sometimes both, AI researchers. This year, eight of our judges then submitted scores and we'll tell you them to determine the winners. And there's four criteria, additivity, so how well does what you build actually fit into the existing content? Functionality, so these artifacts aren't purely decorative because they're in a game. There's a question of can you walk through them? Do they make the environment more accessible? Do they provide affordances? And then there's also the idea about the evocative narrative. So do you look at this and feel this tells a story to me about both the people who lived here, the people who built this. And this year in particular, we have a first entry for optional bonus chronicle challenge. So where you have to produce an actual book about the settlement that was designed. And we have one entry, so they will have one by default, but it's actually quite a strong showing. And I'll encourage you to check that out. And finally, there's aesthetics. And this is less about making stuff look beautiful and more about teaching your AI to avoid the pitfalls of, of PCG that will immediately 
evident to to a human but not to an ai so there's a lot of like building mistakes that um, happen so if you're again interested in uh, seeing the results this is our uh, website uh, we'll also post a link later on and you can go there and you can look at the submissions and uh, the evaluatory maps yourself and soon there will be the code there uh, but if you don't have Minecraft, I'll compile the short video of impressions. Uh, again, I'm just going to check with Diego. Can you actually see the video? Excellent. So uh, here we're coming up on our first settlement. And what we saw this year is a lot of big set pieces. So they evaluated really greatly last time. So we have big pieces like this massive quarry that bind like the settlement together and give them some structure. Also, first time we have underground structures. We have this massive monorail like spanning around an inner city core, again, giving the city some kind of structure. Uh, we've got like massive plazas and also um, different cultural influences. So this uh, clearly more uh, Japanese or, or Asian themed uh, settlement design. I think it was actually submitted from Japan. Um, and also, uh, we have uh, entries to the Chronicle competition. Specifically, you can actually find people's graves in the world now, dig up their graves, and then steal their secret diary, where you can then read about what they thought about in their lives while they were building these settlements. Uh, you can go and ride the actual monorail. It's a bit like riding a roller coaster. And, uh, you know, look around, out yourself, whee! Uh, so that's, that's an option. And uh, again, this year, I think there's a lot more um, atmospheric um, elements in there. So um, walking around between these massive skyscrapers might give you like a feeling of dread. Uh, there's also like a nice coziness being invoked by uh, some of these settlements, particularly at night. Uh, we also have nice technical innovation, actual moving windmills inside Minecraft done with command blocks. We've got procedurally generated houses like these capsule hotels which uh, looks slightly different every time. And uh, this year we've also seen like a lot more interior furnishing. So ghosts ranging from like the ostentatious large rooms to the small and uh, cozy student accommodation. Uh, we also have some more um, uh, technologically focused advances and uh, some smaller hamlets. Oh, and we also this year had a new test map that specifically looked at how people will deal with only small building uh, lands, uh, land being available, particularly this small island. So this actually gets me to the end of the video already. And um, we're now basically ready to announce the winners. So uh, drum roll. Let's have a look at uh, who our uh, judges picked. And this year, the scores were actually quite tight. So um, at third place uh, came an ICE JIT, a submission from a team of students uh, in Japan. And they basically um, had this wonderful uh, piece. It has like large temples, it has big plazas. Uh, the houses have a little degree of variety. There's a lot of... Uh, uh, flattening out the landscape going on, but you do see that these plazas are somewhat adapted to the contours of the water, and they do add a few extra canals. And um, down here, by the way, in the right corner, you see the individual scores, but I'll show you an overview in the end. And place number two is David Mason. David Mason's um, big defining feature was a massive hole in the ground. Uh, so there's this massive query, which really nicely telegraphs the idea of uh, underground structures being present. And if you actually climb down into that quarry, you can explore like the underground mines built by his uh, generator. So it gives a nice reason for the settlement to be there in the first place and uh, create some internal structure. And for place number one, we have Troy, Ryan, and Trent. Um, another, I think, student submission. And here, um, a lot of things come together very nicely. So they scored incredibly high on functionality, like pretty much everything in the settlement is accessible. Uh, the houses are furnished. There's like turn, you can turn on the light on and off inside the houses. There's a bit of variety between the houses. But I think their defining feature is a massive city wall uh, that goes around the whole um, town. 
And this isn't just a set piece that is put down, but basically a function that builds the wall, um, the wall but adapts it to the contour of the land. So in some instances, it still might look a little bit uh, funny, but uh, they do create both a nicely atmospheric settlement and have some really nice, cool uh, technical features there. So um, here's an overview of all the scores. So we had 11 submissions this year. We did actually have some issues with running some of them. So we uh, sent them back to the competitors. And unfortunately, some of them, these issues couldn't be resolved. So the two zero scores are down to us not actually being able to apply these things in time. Uh, the remaining scores, as you might see, are a relatively uh, tight field. Uh, in many ways, and you do also see that uh, so um, uh, the World Foundry, which uh, you saw the um, uh, video on, has the highest narrative score and is uh, the clear winner of the uh, Chronicle Challenge. And uh, you see the um, Troy Ryan and Trent profile uh, massively uh, scored in the uh, functionality score, which probably secured them uh, the win, while Ice JIT. Uh, the third entry uh, scored a lot of points in the aesthetics area. So um, this is my specific pitch now for uh, scientific conference. So if you're interested in getting involved with this, uh, you can of course contact us, follow us on Twitter and join our Discord where you can talk to the participants. And there are various ways on how you can get more involved. So you can of course make your own settlement generator. You can also um, try to, um, you know, get your students involved. I mean, there's a lot of really cool AI things you can actually do in this framework, like build roads with a star, uh, use building grammars, possibly even apply neural networks that you can try out in a relatively easy to get into framework. And um, we're also interested in further research projects in this realm. So we will make both the code, but also our evaluative data are accessible. So maybe you're interested in looking at these settlements and can you know, maybe we're interested in devising an algorithm that can reproduce the human evaluation scores we're making for this automatically. So a lot of these things are possible. And if you're interested in any of those, uh, either, you know, contact us or um, follow us. And for today, I'm going to say, well, uh, unfortunately, no one can be told what Minecraft really is. You have to see it for yourself. So if you I uh, want to uh, check this out. We have uh, over on the Discord, there's an um, um, IP address. So we have a public server up and running uh, where you can hop on and basically play on a composite map that we've created with these algorithms. Because one of the nice things about PCG is once you have it, you can just use it as a design tool. So we picked a map and just applied like all these various filters to different locations. And uh, what you get as the result is a uh, kind of a map that looks like uh, there's a ruins of a fallen civilization there and you can run around and build stuff and reclaim this and play with your friends. And the exhibition server very much is there for people to interact with this. Um, and so if you want to have the pristine maps yourself, you can download them from us. But if you want to see, you know, how this could actually be played with and interacted with, hop on, explore, leave your own mark, claim a house, you know, claim back the wasteland. And uh, also right now, uh, we've also told our competitors um, over at the other thing that um, there is basically the option to um, maybe meet some scientists there. So if you hop on after this session, you might run into some of them. I actually checked, I think one or two are currently on the server. So if you want to talk to some of the people who made this, um, this is a very good chance to do so. And with that, I'm basically done unless there's any question from Diego or others. Thank you, Christoph. Um, are there questions? Anyone? Okay, uh, so San Antonis Liapis uh, asked us if we can leave the server up over the weekend, and we actually plan to uh, leave it up for uh, several weeks. Um, uh, so basically our plan is to kind of see what people will actually do there. So my sneaky plan is to take a look and I mean, I'm not going to write a paper about it, but uh, I'm curious how this kind of, um, you know, interleaved computer human co-creativity will work. So, you know, uh, what will 
people actually do with those uh, creative AI outputs and what will they turn them into? And I have to personally say, I already had a really great experience. I've uh, re remodeled uh, some of these skyscrapers and it feels like I'm not trembling on somebody else's creative vision now. Uh, so nobody's gonna be upset that I'm like kind of adding to their work, right? Uh, Ford was asking if the, the looks are reused from one year to another. Um, yeah, so um, one of the things our judges remarked upon this year is that there's a lot of, or there's a certain degree of code reuse. And I think we see that this year for the first time. So there are these big skyscrapers you saw, for example, were used last year by Eduardo Hauk and are now used in two different entries. And both of them modify the skyscrapers. You get nearly like a genealogy of like uh, solutions. And there's also as I think Mike Cook put it, a certain design language being uh, developed. So there are certain specific solutions that will deploy um, on how to build roads, on how to build buildings, on how to place buildings. And it's really nice. Uh, so the scores this year are a little bit down, but I think this is due to us picking much harder maps and challenging the algorithms much more. But from what's happening, it looks like the quality of the approaches is up because they did build on previous year's um, code base, which we encourage. Okay, another question from Antonios. How big is the annotated data set of settlement at this point? Um, you mean like the ones generated by the um, AI so far? I mean, uh, sorry, I mean the ones that uh, the experts have uh, provided annotations for. So how many like levels do we? Um, so, so this year we basically evaluated nine um, with three different maps. So there's like 27 maps you have uh, data on this year. And then from the previous years, uh, you have another, I think four and, and six. So probably another 30 maps that you have like um, annotated uh, data for, which might not be as uh, comparable. So it's definitely not the, the biggest uh, data set, but uh, Okay, were there uh, any, yeah? Yeah, another question from Tristan. Uh, if the big break th breakthrough of this year entries was large structure elements, can you predict what you're excited to see develop next year? Um, I, I could, but I, I have to admit I'm slightly reluctant. So there seems an interesting trend with, with GDMC is that often like one or two like shortcomings of one year are being uh, chatted up. Like the very first year, a lot of people were saying, why are there no bridges and why are there no bridges working? And so we had then bridges in the next year and the person with the bridges won. And uh, last year, I mean, we did have one big set piece. They didn't actually win, but everybody was like super excited about this. And so this year, a lot of people have big set pieces. So maybe, maybe if I'm uh, my wish, right? If it would be my wish, I'd think like, I'm really, really like this year's winner of the, um, uh, chronicle generation and I do think that weaving in more narrative into the the settlements both explicit and implicit I think would be would be a big step forward and I think what we've also have seen and or talked a lot about is this idea of having kind of a more area differentiation in the settlements. So there's a certain, in the earlier years, homogeneity between, like the whole settlement kind of looks the same everywhere. And the question is, can you have something more like districts or, you know, that, that this space actually kind of makes a, makes a difference. And I think something like that could, uh, could also really put people ahead. But again, I think there's a lot of other ideas and uh, things being discussed. Uh, and what always helps is so our judges provide uh, qualitative feedback as well, which we'll make available uh, soon online. So if people look at like all the feedback given by the various people, there's a lot of like cool ideas in there to, to work with. I think that the district's idea sounds very cool. Uh, I have a question about the, the entries this year. So one of them had underground structures. Is that something that you try to uh, encourage as well or that was just their uh, contribution, unexpected contribution? Well, I mean, we were kind of waiting for it to happen and we were a bit concerned that it might happen and nobody would notice. So I think they found a really good way to make that happen. And, uh, but it's kind of, a, I mean, 
basically all parts of the map are, are technically buildable, right? So people can build underground, but of course, if you build a secret mine somewhere and nobody sees it, then the judges who also don't have infinite time to explore every nook and cranny might not even be um, aware of it, which I actually discussed with uh, Tommy uh, when we were looking at these things together as a challenge of PCG, right? If you make like a, a big complex PCG piece like that, and then you spend a lot of time and effort on making something somewhere inside that piece, how do you actually draw the attention of the people to also find it? I mean, imagine you have this like really, really cool bit somewhere and then nobody ever sees it because it gets drowned out by like all the background uh, procedurally generated content that, that 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 is necessary to kind of embed it right because you can't you can't like have a throne room without like a city around it but you do want people to find like the throne room or something right you could have archaeology through the years so you can discover something that was under a mountain three years ago i think that would be interesting absolutely absolutely and uh, as I said, I mean, the, the server we've set up does feel a bit like that. So because you have this combination of it, I mean, it does, we, we already had like some reports of our uh, participants playing it and it feels quite, quite eerie. And there's definitely a sense of discovery and, and wonderment. And uh, so it already, I think uh, it's up to this level now where it's actually fun to, to play in those ruins. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think there are no more questions, so probably going to finish a bit earlier now, uh, but what uh, better than do so so we can go to Discord and, and actually play these games in the server. So thank you, yeah, Christoph, and thank you, everyone. And yeah. Thank you, Diego. Um, that concludes the uh, FTG day three. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. There's plenty of chat in Discord. I'm very happy about that. Um, keep it up and um, see you on Minecraft. And don't forget, FTG TV coming to you in uh, three hours or less. And see you tomorrow again at uh, two, right? For the well, you know the schedule for the Antonius. What, what's what's FTG TV? Join YouTube. It's in the <laughs> announcement oh. uh, section. Okay. It's it's a YouTube uh, live show that we have every night. So this will be the third That's episode. Awesome. You can actually see the archives if you have time. That's great. Thank you. All right, everyone. We'll close the meeting now. See you tomorrow.